It's good to see you guys. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> Being glad to be here with y'all. I was excited about just being in here tonight and being with you. Turn to Second Peter. Tonight we're going to study. Uh, we're still in chapter 1 since we missed Sunday and so forth like that. But we're starting and hopefully can get through. There's kind of wrapping up this chapter. But we're going to be doing 12 through 21. And uh, we may just go ahead and read those. So it's first, Second Peter chapter 1 verses 12 through 21. We'll just read those right now and then we'll go back and try to get into this. For this reason, this is Peter you know, speaking here or writing. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent or in this body, is what he's saying, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent or this body, he's saying, I'm, that knowing that I'm going to die soon, is what he's saying, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we, he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. That's an important thing. We have the prophetic word, the scripture confirmed, is what we're saying here, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture of, is of any private interpretation. That word there, interpretation, really means origin. It's of no private origin. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So First Peter, going back to the first Peter and just catching us back up a little again, bit again, was dealing with the persecution of the church from the outside. And second, Peter is now dealing with false teachers from the inside. So he looked at what was happening from the outside coming against the church and then looking now at what's coming against the church from the inside. The purpose of first Peter was to encourage these persecuted believers to continue steadfast in their faith no matter what was going on in their life even in the midst of the difficulties, to keep walking, not give up on God, to not get bitter at God, to not throw in the towel and lose their faith, to continue to live godly lives, to love, to continue to love each other and to do good to one another and resist the devil steadfast in their faith and to live their lives as witnesses of their faith in Jesus Christ. That was a big part of this thing, even through the difficulties, is to continue to live a life that would be a witness for Jesus Christ. So I did this last week, I'll do it again. So question number one, you answer this, who wrote Second Peter? That was, that was a tough question. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's, there's opposition of who wrote it. I don't know how because it's pretty plain who it says, but anyway. There is people that say, no, it wasn't Peter, is this one, is that one, and whatever. But according to the word of God that I've got, it says Peter wrote this. So who was, uh, who was first and second Peter addressed to? Who was these letters going to? To the Christians that have been scattered. He even tells us in first Peter where they were scattered to in modern day Turkey and Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So what was going on in the lives of the Christians in first Peter? What were they walking through? Persecution. What was the problem in Second Peter? What, were, what was he addressing? False teachers. 
So 2 Peter is dealing with the danger of false teachers to the, to the Christian faith. How, it can, how people can be deceived and led astray. And these were scoffers, too, of the imminent return of Christ, which we still see today. Scoffers, you know, of the Im imminent return of Christ. He is warning these Christians of their deceptive lies that twist the scriptures, that discredit the faith, and mock the second coming of the Lord. So, Peter stresses in this second letter the importance of the Word of God, the truth, and the need for sound doctrine in order to help these Christians in the church to recognize the false teachers. Having sound doctrine and not being deceived, not being easily swayed and sent, you know, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, remember? In verse 1 of 2, Peter, uh, in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 1, whoo, Peter introduced himself as a bondservant of, of Jesus Christ, and then later, and then secondly, as an apostle. So he recognized that his standing as a slave, as a willing slave, uh, and he was more that, and one that was willing to give himself up for the Lord, he realized that that was more important than his status as an, an apostle. He also addressed this letter to those who have attained like precious faith. It's the same group, but he was saying to those that have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So by this statement, Peter was telling them that there was no superior Christians. They had all received this like precious faith and that, 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 uh, and that them, like everyone else that was saved, had received salvation by the righteousness of God and not by works, not by the efforts of man. So we're all saved, all of us, including them and us today, but the same way, not by works, but by grace, by the grace of God. We're all re redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and we all can enjoy salvation by the same faith that they had that trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 3 and 4, Peter tells us that God, by his divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So it is Jesus' glory and virtue, in other words, who he is and what he is, that motivates him to call us it's his loving kindness it's just who he is god is love it's his love that motivates him to call us and it's who he is his love that motivates us to draw near to him so i want to read to you now uh verses 5 through 11 because i wasn't going to go too much into that just uh, these are the characteristics remember that he said that we needed to be working on so now he's going into this so he's saying now for this reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. What a powerful promise. You do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom, kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter's instruction is that by diligently adding to our faith these seven godly characteristics that we will gloriously enter into heaven and to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord. What a powerful thing. Verses 12 through 15. Let's start there and continue our Bible study. He says, For this reason, 
I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. I thought it was interesting, you know, he says, I want to be, I don't want to be negligent to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. <laughs> what he's basically saying there. And are established in these truths. So Peter is determined that he's going to remind these readers of what they already know and embraced and are embracing because you can't remind somebody of what they don't know. They knew what these things were. They knew what he was teaching them. But they needed reminded. Sometimes we just need a reminder. We need to remember where we came from. What God has done in our life. The good things and, and how he's watched after us. How he's, you know, all these things. It's good to remind ourselves. <clears throat> so he is seeking to remind them of truths which they should continue to embrace as the truth. Because why? Because you got these false teachers that are coming in. You know, twisting the scriptures. And so he's saying, don't forget these things. Don't be deceived. Keep these things. Keep reminding yourself of these truths. He's reminding the saints about the importance of godly character that he listed in verses 5 through 7, those seven godly characteristics. Peter said in verse 13, yes, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. So these reminders had a purpose. They served a purpose. And that purpose was to stir them up. In other words, to encourage them into action. To not just get lazy and not to, to get them to move forward on, on these truths. Peter's desire was to remind the saints over and over so that they could fully remember what they're supposed to remember and be able to recall it at any time they needed it. See, well, that's what I love the fact when, when you know, I, I think we're growing as a church in the Word of God to where if somebody just got up and said something crazy, I hope there's a lot of you that began to pick up. No, wait a minute. That isn't, the, that isn't the Word of God. That goes against the characteristics of God. So that's why we have to continue to study. We have to know the Word of God to be able to not be deceived by these false teachers that are here. The reason that he felt it was so important to remind these Christians and to remind us of these things is because we're forgetful people. <laughs> we tend to forget the good things that God's done in our lives and which leads most of the time to complaining when some little something happens. You know, when you, when you forget the goodness of God, then you just tend to complain. We're quick to forget the consequences of sin. And, it's, and when you forget the consequences of sin, then it's easy just to keep on sinning because you don't think much about it. Why do we forget? Why as Christians will we forget the Word of God? Why would we not take these things in? And, and this is a hard, this, this hurts me right here now. Listen, we forget because we don't value something enough. That's why you forget. Whew, that hurts. And you forget because you don't make the proper effort to remember. You don't see the importance of this enough to remember it. And then when the time comes, you forgot, and then you're deceived. The importance of the Word of God. Peter's saying, you need to remember, and as long as I'm alive and in this body, I'm going to keep reminding you. I'm going to keep telling you over and over and over. I'm going to keep stressing these points. And he, well, we'll get to here in a minute. You know, I've noticed over the years, and I've been here too, I, I, can, I can understand, that we're typically, especially it seems like as younger Christians, I know I was, so fired up, and I just wanted to go and hear something new. 
you know, you wanted to go and get that new revelation. But I think it's more important because, well, first of all, let me say, Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun, right? The Bible was written 2,000 years ago, or, you know, or longer. Uh, and there's very little, if any, new revelation in the Word of God. You might be something new for you that you can gain, but it's not something that's being added to some new things that coming in the Word of God. It's there. The Word of God's complete. So, you know, like I say, as a young Christian, a lot of times we were just so fired up. We want to run here and run there and, and get this new thing. When I think it's a good reminder just to get solid on the foundation. Take the things that, that are most important to your walk with God and continue to remind yourself of those over and over and over. Athletes, we all know this, you know, it doesn't matter how great an athlete you are, professional athletes, they still on a daily basis practice the fundamental things over and over and over since they've done in elementary school. Why? Because you get the fundamental things down, the rest of it will take care of itself. So it's like sometimes we just need to keep reminding ourselves, keep going back over, keep talking about the cross, keep talking about the blood, keep talking about, you know, Jesus and who he is and salvation. And, and, uh, and because it, I don't know that if we studied it from now on and never changed the topic, if we could ever truly get it all anyway. So there's so much there. In verse 14, Peter said, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. Peter remember what Jesus had said to him concerning how he would die. In John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19, this is the words of Jesus to John. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. The Bible, the, the Bible says this, This he spoke signified by what death uh, Peter would glorify God. So Jesus prophesied years back that, that Peter was going to die a martyr for the faith. And Peter knew that his time was coming near. Many believe that during the writing of this letter, he was actually imprisoned, waiting to be executed. So his time was drawing nigh. I think it's interesting with the days close at hand of his death, you know, if, if you were, the doctor gave you three days to live, what would you say to your family? What would you write? What would you say? Peter wrote to remind them of the truth of the word of God and the things that they should hold on to and not be deceived on. So I think that's, man, this probably was the foremost and most important thing in Peter's mind that he wanted to share with these people. He understood that his death was coming soon, and not only did he want to remind them of the truth while he was alive, but he, got, he wanted to continue to remind these Christians through his letter after his death. And see, not only did he remind them, he's reminding us tonight. This thing's still going on. Peter's been reminding ever since he wrote this letter. Verse 16 through 18. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made to known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know, you think Peter's saying to these people, look, I'm not, we're not just giving you hearsay passed down stuff and things we've talked about and dreamed about and visions and all these kind of things. We witnessed this thing. We were there. He goes on to say that uh, uh, but we're eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This was during the transfiguration of Jesus. Peter, James, and John were with him. They were eyewitnesses. They, they saw this with their own eyes. 
They're saying we're not writing you some fairy tale to you. We're telling you what we've seen, heard, and experienced. Peter was reminding these Christians that the disciples of Jesus didn't make up fables and myths, but rather told what they had saw, what they had experienced, and what they had heard as eyewitnesses being with the Lord. He points out that, uh, uh, well, I've already hit that. So Peter and the other disciples could lean on their own personal experiences and could conf confidently say that Christians are not, are, are not simply following man's devised fables. You know, they had been there. So they could with confidence say, listen, you're not following a bunch of stories, a bunch of myths, a bunch of, you know, uh, made up man-made stuff that we are eyewitnesses of this thing. But to back up the truth of Jesus our Lord, Peter goes on to say, uh, to give an even more reliable source than, our, than his own experiences. You know, I've thought about that. You know, it's easy to, I've said this before. I said, you know, I can, you can argue with me on doctrine, but you can't argue with me on experience because I've experienced but there's something more reliable than your experience. That's something that to catch hold of. Because we can be, our experiences can be kind of flawed as well. So let's see what it was. Verse 19 through 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture. He's talking about writing of Scripture here. You know, the, well, the Lord speaking to these, the Holy Spirit leading these people to write these books of the Bible and so forth. No prophecy of Scripture is, is, is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So as reliable and trustworthy as the experiences were that the disciples had when they followed Jesus, Peter's making the point that God's revelation in Scripture is even more reliable and trustworthy. It's a more trustworthy way to know the truth about God. I could be deceived in my experience, but the word of God is truth. That's powerful. Peter points out the certainty of prophecy in scripture as he reminds these Christians that the prophets themselves relied on God and not on their own understanding. He goes on to explain that the prophecies were not made by human will, but by the Holy Spirit moving on the writers as they recorded the word of God. He helps us understand an important principle about interpreting the Bible here. Readers, us as readers, are not to determine the meaning of the Bible. The author is the only one that's qualified to determine the meaning. He says what he says. Instead of asking, what does this text mean to me? The question we should ask is, what does God say? That's important. Not just to say, well, I just feel like that means, you know, I can do this or I can do that. No, what does the scripture say? God is the only authority. And what he, if, the, if this word of God is given by inspiration of God through holy men of God that wrote down what the Holy Spirit told them right down, that's what we need to be going by and, and take, it, take it for what it says, not what I think it means. So the meaning of a passage of scripture isn't different for one person and another person. It says what it says. It's not, well, I think it means this to me. Well, it means this to me. You might get some, de depending upon what you're walking through or what your situation is at the time, it may speak to you a little differently or, or have, you know, encourage you in a different way, but it means what it says. So I think that's important as we continue to grow right now because so, I think so much, especially in Pentecostal type churches a lot of times, we have such liberty with the word of God that we kind of let it mean whatever it wants to mean to anybody that wants to 
let it mean something. But we got to get it down that the word of God is the word of God. It means what it says. So there's different applications based upon your situation, but the meaning does not change. Because of the certainty and the reliability of the Bible, Christians can have confidence that the scriptures will accurately guide them and what they read in the word of God is not a collection of devised fables. See, that's important. If it can mean this and mean that, then it's not accurate. We need accuracy in the word of God. It means what it says and we can trust it. We can rely on it to know that it means what it says. In verse 19, Peter goes on to say that we do well to heed the prophetic word of God as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter is saying here that just like a lamp lights up a darkened room and shows us the way to go until the sun begins to come up. You know, this light gives you light to see and where you can walk around in the room until the sun begins to come up and shine through the windows enough to light up the room. That one day the Lord Jesus will return and that's the day that the light of God will truly dawn and the morning star will truly rise in our hearts. But until that day, the prophetic word of God, the scriptures, are to be the lamp. And we can confidently trust what it says and be able to walk in its light. So the light that lights up the darkness, that gives us the ability to see and to take a step and to go when we don't know which way to go, is the word of God until he himself comes. Verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first... That no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter was not writing about how scripture here should be interpreted, but was writing about how God is the authoritative origin and source of these prophecies, of these scriptures. Now that's huge too. That he is the author of these prophecies. He's reminding us that the writers of these prophecies did not write their own thoughts or interpretations, but truths that came directly from the Holy Spirit. So knowing this first, he said. In other words, Peter wanted us to know above everything else that God inspired the Bible and not men. The false teachers that Peter is warning us about denying the divine origin of scriptures. They claim these writings came from visions and dreams and signs and all kinds of things. But Peter says these apostolic writers, writings originated from God, not a human author. The word prophecy here is the written message. That's what it means, the written message or of a prophet or a writer of scripture. So it's the, the writings of scripture. To point, the point to remember is that God is the author of all scripture. And thank God he makes no mistakes. It's solid, you know, it's, we can trust it, we can depend on it. And we can have complete confidence in the word of God. So that concludes, hopefully, chapter one. But I do want to throw it out there because even though I thought as I was going to wrap this chapter up or that, that chapter up, um, I thought, well, this will be kind of quick and easy. But man, there's a lot of stuff right there. It's amazing what you can glean and what, you know, just how powerful the word of God is. So take a moment, jot down real quick some thoughts, some thing comments you want to make. Uh, some maybe some what you gleaned from this tonight, how you can apply it to your life now. Dun, 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 dun. So as you're doing that, just just as a public service announcement, <laughs> um, don't forget baptism. We're gonna have a baptism this Sunday after church. Just come, be a part, and we're gonna celebrate. Through baptism. What stands out to me is that 
Peter, even though he knew he was going to be dying soon, he stayed the course and he continued to do the kingdom work that he was called to do. And because he did that, it's still ministering to us today. So it went way beyond his lifetime. So, and he didn't, he didn't hold anything back. He just put it out there, you know, and um, he didn't fluff it up or anything. He just laid it right out there for him, and I can appreciate that. That's good. I don't know. This may be more of a question than a, but when you were t saying that the word is the word as it was written by, I couldn't help but think about the Logos word and the Rhema word. And, and there is, there's the times when the word becomes an inspired specific word spoken to us. The, the, content of the word doesn't change but it becomes a specific thing relevant to us right so the one that i was looking at where it's uh, verse 16 we do not follow cleverly devised myths is what my translation says and partly it's because of uh, ongoing conversation i've been having with my daughter because she said they're studying the Age of Enlightenment and Immanuel Kant, and now this week they're actually studying the Communist Manifesto. But, you know, a lot of those ideas that people had in those ages weren't all wrong, but they just started with the wrong premise, and they were not obviously enlightened by the, by the Lord at all. So I guess that's one of those things that is always a beauty to me is how simple the gospel actually is. Man is a sinner and needs a savior and it is distilled in that. And that's it's pretty amazing that all all of it can be distilled like that. Yeah, I've thought about this many times in uh, verses 10 and 11 where he says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if we, if we, ye do these things, ye shall never fail. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What that means to me is the most important thing I need to be doing. I mean, I got a lot of things going on this week and next week and so on. But the most important thing I need to do with my whole life is keep my focus on him and to do that to keep my focus on this book that is the most important thing nothing else could should be coming before that if I, I need to remember I need to keep things down here are only temple they don't matter one day when I take my last breath I want to make. I want to be able to say I've run the course. I've done what I needed to do for Jesus. I tried to do my best to honor Him, and that's what it's saying here. He's saying, keep, keep, just keep going on the course. Give diligence. Make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. We just need to keep going on, keep going on, and make sure that what we do, every step of our life, honors him and his will. And once we do that, everything else is gonna fall into place. All right, how many of y'all have heard the George Strait song, Write This Down? Show of hands. All right, I'm disappointed, y'all. Um, there's a lyric in there that uh, says, Take my words, read them every day, keep them close by, don't you let them fade away. Now, I think it goes without saying that George Strait wasn't writing that song about the Bible and God, but if you really put that into perspective and read the last couple of verses in this chapter, I mean, that might be God talking to his children. Just put that into perspective. I was just looking at verse 12. 
how he made the importance of for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things though you know and established in the presence of truth the truth of it all and then you know just go down to verse 21 I mean it just sums it all up that none of this came from a man it came from the Holy Spirit through a man and that you know we we don't need to try to make it about us specifically but the Holy Spirit and what God is trying to tell us here is just never never forget and always be reminded remind yourself daily I just think we have to uh, let me see what I wrote. we have to uh, stay on course and not be easily swayed mm -hmm. and know the word mm -hmm. it's funny because um, Second Peter is now talking to us about the false teachers right for some reason right and if you read the Bible there's a lot a lot a lot of verses about uh, false teachers but not only false teachers there's also people that they're just interpreting the word incorrectly which I mean they are teaching falsely that's probably not their intention um, one of the things in Jude uh, Jude 1 uh, verse 3 says beloved while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the Saints um, also if you read first Corinthians verse uh, 4 chapter 6 it says now these things brethren I have uh, transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think beyond what it's written and uh, those are the things because people just take a verse and then they just go on on and on about something that might not be what's there and I think it's dangerous and I think we as Christians we should really contend for the faith for the word for sound doctrine amen the application for me I think is just reminding myself often that this was an eyewitness account and we can be sure of what it says um, what Peter witness can be trusted and we can be sure of it because he was there and because of that we should heed pay careful attention to it as a light that shines in the dark uh, until the morning star dawns in her heart so I think the application is just reminding ourselves and paying attention to that yep I just think that um, the last three verses there. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. I like that. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. We're not waiting on, like with bated breath, for, for something else to happen. Uh, Jesus, the seed that from Genesis 3.15 was promised they were eyewitnesses now they're eyewitnesses not only to him being glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration but we also know that that Peter was an eyewitness I've paid a lot of attention to Peter everywhere else in the New Testament since we've been doing this and Peter was uh, the first one of the first to see Jesus uh, resurrected and and um, and so Peter is telling them and so we have the prophetic word confirmed and which you would do well to heed as light that shines in a dark place. He's saying, you know, just pay attention to this. But it's kind of like almost, not yet, uh, until the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation or originates from man, like you said. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God, as they spoke, and we're moved by the Spirit. And Revelation 19, verse 10 says, John said, And I fell at his feet to worship him. He's talking about this angel. He said, See to me that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And here's the clutch part right here. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
So prophecy is about Jesus. In Isaiah 40, um, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God, all the way back through the mouth of Isaiah and, and, and way prior to that in Genesis chapter 3, prophesying that, that the seed would come. Peter saying, we were eyewitnesses to his, to his glory and then to his resurrection, which now, uh, for this reason, I'll not be negligent to remind you of these things. And so when we think about you know, uh, um, the importance of what's being distributed right here. You, I think you said it just a few minutes ago. Peter's message continues today to us. And, and let us not miss that valuable point that, that, you know, when we hear it, in terms of deception, we've just talked about, Lord, help us not to be deceived. In terms of deception... Uh, would there be people, like Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, that would try to lead us into another gospel? Nate's brought it up, verse 16, cunningly devised fables. Those things are out there and potentially can set any one of us off the right set of tracks at any occasion. And deception doesn't knock on the door and ring the doorbell and say, hey, I'm deception, I'm just here. I was wondering if I could come in for a minute. And so... What we have here is this framework, this this framework that we need to adhere to, and it's the Word. And it's, and it's uh, again, it's what Peter said, it's what, what's, what everybody's been saying. But it's stitch it together and hear what the, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us, the body, tonight through through uh, uh, His Word. It's, it's just amazing to me. No, I, I agree. I can't remember like how many, but I've read where how many prophecies have been fulfilled in the Bible. I mean, it's like even prophecies concerning the coming of the Lord. You know, there's hundreds of them, and they're all fulfilled perfectly. So he's saying, you know, these things, you know, not only am I an eyewitness, but the prophetic word has been confirmed. Yeah, that's a powerful thing, huh? You know, talking about the deception and the fables and everything, I've just been really <laughs> hearing things about them, you know, rewriting the Bible with just little little changes, you know. And the thing with that is, we must know the Word, as in we we know Him in our heart too, to know whether or not those that's right or you know right or not whenever they change just little things and stuff like that but anyway what i was going to say for me i was just um amazed that peter was worried about them when he was in such a you know he had to have been suffering in the prison you know and even in the middle of him suffering he's got his eyes on the lord and on what god is asking him to do and not on himself i just thought that was just a really something to take away from you know 